Good morning. Welcome to Sunland Neighborhood Church. Um, we're glad you can join us this morning, and uh, thank you for joining for our worship. We're here to worship our Lord Jesus Christ this morning. So if you would, uh, bow in prayer with me. Holy Father God, cleanse us of our sin so we can worship you this morning with a pure heart. Fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we would worship you in spirit and truth. Thank you that we can enter your courts with rejoicing, praise, thanksgiving for our salvation and hope of heaven. Father God, we love you, we adore you, we bless your holy name. Great are you, Lord, in power and love and greatly to be praised. You alone are God and there is none like you. You made and sustained heaven and earth by your mighty power. By your faithfulness, the sun rises each day. Splendor and majesty are before you. Strength and beauty are in your sanctuary. We ascribe to you, O Lord, glory and strength this day. We ascribe to you, O Lord, glory that is due your name. We bring our offerings of praise and thanksgiving and rejoicing for your salvation, for your goodness, for your grace, for your mercy, for your great faithfulness, for your everlasting loving kindness. Today we worship you in the splendor of your holiness. We humble ourselves and bow only to you, the Lord God Almighty. Praise and glory to you, Lord God, that you are king above all kings. You reign above heaven and earth. Lord, we also come to you in prayer. Please bless our worship. May it be pleasing to you as a sweet aroma. Please fill us with joy as we sing praises to you. Please speak through Ryan this morning as he teaches us your word. Please give us ears to hear your truth. May it change us to be more like Jesus. We also pray for our country that is in turmoil. Please eradicate this virus so we can return to fellowship and worship at church. Please heal and save those suffering from COVID. Please guide the development of the vaccine and treatments. Glory to you, Lord God, for the progress that you have, been, you have enabled us to make so far. We pray for your intervention into the turmoil in our cities around our country. May you stop the violence and destruction. May you restore law and order. May you restore peace in our land. We rejoice that you are sovereign. Help us to remember that you are in control of all things. May we not fear because you are with us. Grant us hope, courage, and faith in you. Thank you that we can call upon you in times of trouble, and we know that you hear us. Today we rejoice in your grace and mercy upon us. May you be exalted and glorified in our worship this morning. And we all say, Amen. Good morning. Um, let's praise his name this morning.
Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Today's reading. Okay, today's reading is from Psalm 7, a psalm of David, when he sang to the Lord concerning Cush of the tribe of Benjamin. I come to you for protection, O Lord my God. Save me from the persecutors. Rescue me. If you don't, they will maul me like a lion, tearing me to pieces with no one to rescue me. O Lord my God, if I have done wrong or am guilty of injustice, if I have betrayed a friend or plundered my enemy without cause, then let my enemies capture me. Let them trample me into the ground and drag my honor in the dust. Arise, O Lord, in anger. Stand up against the fury of my enemies. Wake up, my God, and bring justice. Gather the nations before you. Rule over them from on high. The Lord judges the nations. Declare me righteous, O Lord, for I am innocent, O Most High. End the evil of those who are wicked and defend the righteous. For you look deep within the mind and heart, O righteous God. God is my shield, saving those whose hearts are true and right. God is an honest judge. He is angry with the wicked every day. If a person does not repent, God will sharpen his sword. He will bend and string his bow. He will prepare his deadly weapons and shoot his flaming arrows. The wicked conceive evil. They are pregnant with trouble and give birth to lies. They dig a deep pit to trap others, then fall into it themselves. The trouble they make for others backfires on them. The violence they plan falls on their own heads. I will thank the Lord because he is just. I will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High.
Lord God Almighty. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you to the worship team. You know, um, we, uh, I don't know if you noticed, you probably heard a really loud noise. You possibly heard a really loud noise during that first song. It's because one of our monitor channels blew. And uh, we actually had one of our monitors on fire or smoking. So um, that's not the kind of smoke machine I wanted to get for our church, um, but it worked. So uh, yeah, so a lot of, I don't know, it's, I'm just standing back there playing bass and I'm just watching Sydney <laughs> sing. She can't hear herself at all, right? Because it's just this loud pitch noise. It's just amazing. It's amazing to watch all of our ladies up front singing and doing great and and uh even though you can't hear so anyway why don't we pray and uh <laughs> and we'll get started father thank you again for today and lord we recognize your presence in this place we recognize your goodness and um lord we we invite you um to instruct our hearts instruct our souls from your word Show us, uh, Lord, teach us. Let our ears and our eyes and our hearts be open to you, Father. And Holy Spirit, we invite you now just to, to lead us wherever, wherever we are, sitting on, at home on our couch, um, watching this, this video. Uh, Lord, would you, would you lead us? We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, welcome. This is our last week of our series in the book of Psalms. The series has been titled Keep Psalm and Carry On. And we are looking at seven different types of psalms. So the psalms are, are there are seven, seven different kind of genres of the psalms. And what happens is, is what we found is that this book doesn't just teach us, it doesn't, it's just a compilation of beautiful poems written to God. This is a book that teaches us a blueprint for how to live beautifully with God. Okay, and so if you remember, the first week we looked at wisdom and how wisdom is an important thing for us to pursue as children of God. It's it's important for us. It's crucial. It's vital for us. We have looked through the weeks about um, how we need to have the greatness of God and the greatness of the promises of his Messiah, Jesus, at the forefront of our minds as much as we possibly can, that we build our lives on this, okay? We've looked at thanksgiving and how living with gratitude is a beautiful way to live life. It's actually healthy for us to live that way, okay? Now, and then we've also looked at how the Psalms teach us, the pilgrimage Psalms teach us that we are on a journey with God. And so to live with that mindset, to have, to have that picture in mind, that things are not overnight, that we are in a journey with God, that there's a long, uh, Eugene Peterson writes about this in his book called Obedience in the Same Direction, that we're, we're walking in step with God, we're, we're moving in the same direction of Him, right? We've also looked at how God wants us to be honest with him, to come to him with our cares. So we saw that in the Lament Psalms. And so this week we're going to look at the final Psalms. And these are the ones that many of us as Christians don't like to talk about at parties. Okay? These are the, these are the nasty ones. These are the ones that kind of people point to and they say, gosh, that, that does not seem very nice. That's not very PC. That's not, it's just really, really ugly what this person's saying. They're very gritty. So these psalms are kind of like that that relative that comes to the Christmas party who kind of says the things that 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 you think but you 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 know you know better than to say, but your relative says it anyway. And so you just sit there and and maybe you're that person who kind of likes to get the ball rolling. You know, you get them started, then you sit back with some popcorn and you just watch the carnage, right? You evil mastermind, right? But maybe that's what, but th- that's what these Psalms are. They're kind of like that, that, that cringy relative, you know, the, in, in, your, in your Christmas party. And we don't like to talk about them very much. What are they called? They're called imprecatory Psalms. Imprecatory Psalms. And they are truly present. Ashley just read one for you. They are 
Um, they can be gritty. They can be real. They're, you're just like, wow, you said that. Okay, wow. I mean, that, that, there's a lot of that that goes on with these psalms. What is an imprecatory psalm? An imprecation is a curse that invokes misfortune upon someone. That's what an imprecation is. So imprecatory psalms are those in which the author calls down calamity, destruction, and God's anger and judgment on his enemies. Okay? So this person is, is praying for God's judgment to come upon their, on their enemies. Okay? And so these can be a little bit unsavory. Let's just put it this way. All right, let me read you a few. Um, you just heard one from Ashley. Let me read you a few more, okay? Just little pieces. Declare them guilty, O God. Let their intrigues be, down, be their downfall. Banish them for their many sins, for they have rebelled against you. Rise up, O Lord. Confront them. Bring them down. With your sword, rescue me from the wicked. Let death take my enemies by surprise. Let them go down alive to the grave. Oh God, break the teeth in their mouths. May they be blotted out of the book of life and not listed with the righteous. Woo. Right? Pour out your wrath on the nations that do not acknowledge you, on the kingdoms that do not call on your name, for they have devoured Jacob and devastated his homeland. If only you, God, would slay the wicked. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord? And abhor those who are in rebellion against you. I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them as my enemies. May his children be fatherless and his wife be a widow. And here's the mother of them all. Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them upon the rocks. That's Psalm 137.9. So when you think of these Psalms and you look at them, I, I think it's pretty natural for many of us to go, whoa. Like, wow, that's a little bit over the top, isn't it? I mean, how can we believe in a God who's okay with this? As a matter of fact, some atheists will, will talk very openly about this, Christopher Hitchens being one of them. He wrote a book called God is Not Good, right? God is Not Great, I think is the name of the book. And in that book, he talks about how religion poisons everything. And this is a person who's poisoned by their religion, you know? The problem is, is if what happens I find with some of this is you might read this one statement and you don't really understand the full psalm. You don't really grasp a hold of the full context of what is being said there. You know? And so you just read this one statement like, happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them upon the rocks. You read it and you think, oh my gosh, that's so horrific. That's so horrible. Right? A few years ago, I was on Facebook, and um, I had a friend on Facebook. For some reason, he stopped being my friend a while ago. I, I don't know when that happened. He did not bother to tell me. But he wrote on his page, death to all Christians, to all pastors, especially to all pastors and priests. That's what he wrote on his Facebook page. And, uh, you know, I, I was obviously dismayed by what I saw there. But knowing him at least a little bit, I know that he did not mean that he was going to pit, put bullets in a gun and come find us and, and kill every Christian he could find, right? That was not what he was saying. He was being, he was just being tooth and, hopefully he was being tongue in cheek, right? Hopefully he was being, trying to be clever or something, you know? We don't really know, right? Because it's just a little sound bite. That's the problem we get sometimes. We look at some of this stuff and then someone points to it and says, see, religion poisons everything. And you're like, have you read the entire psalm? Do you understand what Psalm 37 says? Let me give you a little background of it first before then we move on, okay? Psalm 30, 137 talks about how the Edomites and the Babylonians came in and took the Israelites captive. And one of the very first verses early on in the psalm, he talks about how the Babylonians took them away and made them sit down in a foreign land by some river or body of water that they didn't know what it was. And then their captives came up to them and said, hey, sing us songs about your homeland. Sing for me, slave. And so these Israelites are like, how can we sing? We're, we're completely destroyed. Like, we're just, we're distraught. We're, we're brokenhearted. And you're asking us to sing? You know? And then they're talking, they're talking more about what the Edomites did to them. And then they talk about how they're praying and they're saying, God, 
may you bring justice to the Edomites and the Babylonians for what they did to us and what they've done to others. And then comes the line, happy is the one who dashes your babies upon the rocks. And what he's saying there, he's not saying, I'm going to go out and kill a Babylonian baby. What he's saying is, is that that is, you know, that's justice. That's what you did to us. In that day and age, it was very common for a conquering army to come in and do those kinds of things. To kill children, to do all that stuff. They would wipe out people. Okay? It was very common. And so it becomes known as a, kind of like an ancient idiom as well. Like where you sit there like a hyperbolic statement, but it's an, it's an idiom of, of being defeated, of being conquered. Okay? So they might, even the psalmist might not be writing literally, hey, we want you to kill babies. What he's saying is it's using an ancient idiom for being conquered. Okay? And so sometimes what we have to do is we have to be careful when we're reading scriptures like this. We have to fully understand. We have to ask the question, how would an ancient Jewish person read this? Right? Because they're the original readers. How would they read this? And so, but these psalms, in, it is still gritty, right? It's still difficult to read. It's still hard. It's still unsavory. But in the middle of all of this is, is a psalmist who is just brokenhearted. I, I think what the psalmist is saying with this whole baby, it's kind of like when a mother says to a, a mother says to her son or a father says to her, her, his son, you know, I really hope someday you grow up to have a kid who's just like you, right? You're like, why would you say that, right? But that's, that's, that's kind, it's kind of the same idea, right? You know, I want you to experience my pain. I want you to see what it was like for me to live with you, right? That's the, the imprecatory psalms here are a cry for justice. If someone were to harm your family, your friends, your neighbors, if somebody, somebody were to take control and, and enact violence, right? There's parts of us that clamor for justice, right? There's parts of us inside. Look around you. Look on the news. Isn't this the big cry right now? We want justice. We want justice. That's part of us. It's part of who we are. It's wired into our being. Because we are made in the image of a just God. And so the fact of the matter is, is there is this clamoring for justice in us. And while these words may not necessarily be the most savory words, I think they're honest, aren't they? They tend to be the kinds of words sometimes that we think. Not, you know, dash babies upon rocks, but, you know, Lord, get them back. Let's look a little bit more at imprecatory psalms. There's three things I want to share with you real briefly in the time we have remaining. That each of these psalms is built upon. They're themes, okay? That these psalms have in common with one another. And they're very instructive to us. The first theme is this. These psalms focus on a God who is wonderful, powerful, merciful, and good. That's the focus of these psalms. They, they're present in the Psalms. The one that Ashley read for us, right? Just this, this mighty grandeur of God's greatness and power and his justice, right? Is so present in this Psalm. The imprecatory Psalms are very big on God's greatness, okay? His goodness. And what they do is they contrast this great and glorious and wonderful and beautiful God. They contrast him with these evil, rebellious nations that line themselves up against him. These, these nations that have turned against God and said, we're going to worship other gods and goddesses. And not only that, but we are going to spit in your face. We're going to be the God of our own lives. We're going to be the captain of our own souls. That's the heart of sin. And so when these psalmists are writing, they're saying, look, there's this beautiful God, this wonderful, glorious God who treats us with justice and mercy, who, who wants to bless, right? And yet there's this world of people who are living in opposition to him. And for the psalmist, this is just an outrage. Okay? Secondly, the second theme is at the heart of the psalms is a real love and passion for God and for his glory. 
Okay, so the first part is, the first theme is that these Psalms talk about the greatness and the wonderfulness of God and the grandeur of God, the power of God, the goodness, the justice of him. The second theme is often, we love you. We love you so deeply. We want you to be glorified. We are hurt. We are brokenhearted at the fact that you are rebelled against and your glory is not sought after. Your glory is not brought. And this breaks our hearts. Psalm 139 is a beautiful example of this, okay? Psalm 139 has one little piece that goes imprecatory. Most of the psalm is just this beautiful psalm of praise. If you remember Psalm 139, David talks about how he was formed in his mother's womb, that he was fearfully and wonderfully made by God, that God hems him in before and behind, that God pursues him and is good to him every day of his life, that God thinks about him, that God is gracious to him and just and merciful and just this amazing love song to God. Then all of a sudden in verse 20, David goes, oh, how you would slay the wicked. Away from me, you bloodthirsty men. And he just, just goes full imprecatory mode, right? In this part of the psalm. It's crazy. And you sit there and you watch, you go, what are you doing? Why is this happening? Why, why in this beautiful, great, glorious psalm, all of a sudden it's just, just ugliness? But do you see, it's this, it's this explosion of David. It's this explosion in the psalm of his love and his brokenheartedness over the fact that there are so many who stand in God's face and spit in it every day. And so David is just like, am I supposed to sit by? Am I supposed to sit idly by? Oh God, will you take, take them out? You know, and he's, it's ugly. It's, it's gritty. But in the heart of it is this deep love, this deep passion for God. I think sometimes for us, it's hard for us to understand. We look and we go, man, geez, you know what? Chill out, David, a little bit. And then the question comes, wait, why, don't, why doesn't that happen to me? You know, I wonder sometimes. Kind of like, you know, maybe you've seen this on a TV show or something. Two boys sitting on a wall and uh, they're talking and laughing, just kind of palling around. Maybe they're eating some candy or something. And then one boy brings up the other boy's mom. Says something about the other boy's mom. And the other boy looks and says, what'd you say? I said this about your mom. Say that again. I'll say it again. Say it to my face. I'll say it to your face. You know what? You're a jerk. You're a jerk. Your mom's a jerk. You're, you don't say anything about my mom. And then it starts going, right? And then the boys are throwing punches. Because you can't talk about my mama like that. My mama's not like that. My mama's good. My mama's this. My mama's that. You can't talk about mama that way. Leave mama alone, right? And the whole idea is what? I love my mother. You do not talk about my mother that way. Husband, I love my wife. You don't talk about my wife that way. You don't do that. Right? It's the same, it's the same kind of thing. I think sometimes it's hard for us to understand, but if we can put it in that context and understand, it's, if it's very similar, you don't talk about God that way. You don't spit in his face like this and expect me to be okay with it. This is breaking my heart. Because he is my, he's the absolute passion of, he's the love of my life. In precatory Psalms, there's a deep belief that God is truly good and wonderful. And at the heart of them all is a deep passion for God's glory. Let me give you the third one. There's a deep recognition that the only one who could bring justice is God himself, who is ultimately just. You will notice this in the imprecatory Psalms, probably here more than any other psalms, the power of God's justice. The problem that we have in the church sometimes is we emphasize God's love, okay? Especially nowadays. We emphasize, and there are certain areas of the church, there are certain forms of Christianity that are coming out nowadays that just emphasize God's love, 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 and they don't emphasize justice at all. But he is both, isn't he? He is love and he is just. It's not loving for him to not be just. And it's not just for him to not be loving, right? It's, he's both. Okay, it's, it's, so they focus on this. And what I love about the imprecatory Psalms is they're saying, God, I recognize that you are the one who is just. 
You are the one. I'm looking to you for deliverance. I'm looking to you to set all things right. You are the one. You alone. I can do some things. I can try to help. You know, we, we're looking at what's happening in our culture today. We can look around and go, okay, we can help. We can try some new policies. We can try some new things here and there to, to try to help um, you know, our culture come together. We can have dialogues. We can, do, we can try to do all this stuff. I can try to listen to people and all these things. But in the end, the cry of our hearts is for God to actually make this world a place that is safe and is true and honest and that has no sin and no destruction. The cry of every human heart is to see God restore this world. He's the only one who can. That's what these psalms are talking about. They keep going back to this. And, and they, they respect and they expect God to be the one to administer justice. I love this story about David. You may remember this. David, King David, he's not a king yet. He's in a cave. He's hiding from Saul, who is the king of Israel. Now Saul has been told by God, I'm taking the throne away from you. And so what does Saul do? He rebels. He spits in God's face over and over again. He's hunting David down. And so David is hiding in a cave, and Saul comes in to relieve himself, to use the restroom. Saul's literally caught with his pants down. And David is around the corner behind a rock, and he and his buddy are sitting there, and they look up, and they see Saul, and then they go back down, and David's friend goes, David, God has given Saul into your hands. It's time. Take your revenge. Take your vengeance. And David looks at the guy and he says, I can't do it. Saul is God's anointed. I cannot raise a knife or a spear or a sword against him. And so David goes out and he cuts a little piece off of Saul's robe, if you remember. Saul leaves the cave, has no idea what's going on. And then David comes out, holds up a piece of the robe, says, I could have killed you, Saul, but you are God's anointed. Can't you see I'm not your enemy? But David had every right, he had every ability right then and there to administer justice. And everyone, probably anybody in his shoes, would have thought possibly, yeah, this is a good idea. But these psalmists, they look and they say, no, no, God is the one who will enact justice. If we forget that, folks, then ultimately we become the one who enacts justice. What do you think unforgiveness and bitterness towards someone else is? Ultimately, in the end, it's me. I will not let go of what you've done to me. You don't deserve it. I am bringing justice upon you. You may not know it, but I am. I'm unforgiving you. I call you unforgiven in the words of Metallica, right? Or I dub thee unforgiven. That's what it is. So, so there's this picture here in the Psalms of God being just and God being the one who will set all things right someday. The problem that we have is we live in a world that can be cruel, harsh, unjust, don't we? People get trampled on, they get overlooked, they get crushed down, they get used and abused. And I don't think that the Psalms are saying that there's nothing they can do about it, but they're saying that ultimately any of their efforts will fail without God, and that ultimately they are powerless to bring justice without God, and ultimately God is the one who will restore justice. That is our hope. So at the heart of the imprecatory Psalms is an ardent faith that God is great. It's a passionate love and desire to see God's glory, a broken heart at the things that break God's heart, and an unrelenting hope and trust that God alone can and will restore all this. So let me give you one final question here. Should we pray imprecatory psalms? That's the question. Should we pray them? And I, I said, you know, to be honest, we, we already do. If any of you prayed, come, Lord Jesus, come. Return. Come back to us, Jesus. We've been waiting for your return. What's going to happen when Jesus returns? Do we think it's going to be some big kumbaya you know, happy, happy, age of Aquarius. This is the time for the season of loving kind of thing. It's not going to be that way, right? we I don't know, somewhere along the way, we have kind of come to believe in this Jesus who is this ishy, squishy, 
splooshy Jesus, you know, warm, bleeding heart kind of guy, you know? And he is loving, and he is merciful, and he is kind, and he's also just. And when we see Jesus in the book of Revelation, we see a very different Jesus than sometimes we have sold to us. This is a Jesus who has a sword coming out of his mouth. This is a Jesus who kills the Antichrist by breathing on him. This is a Jesus who has blood staining his robes as he's flying throughout the earth and he's bringing fire to the world. The world will be on fire. Jesus is going to return and he's going to judge and we're asking for Jesus to come back. That's an imprecatory prayer. It really is. Now let me, let me ask you this. Should we pray with a faith that God is great, good, holy, and just? Yes. Should we pray calling for God's glorious will to be done and for his name to be lifted high? Yes. Is it okay to be brokenhearted at all the evil and the hate that are perpetrated in this world? Yeah, it's okay. Is it even okay to be a little angry at it? Yeah. Righteous indignation? Yeah. Right? Is it okay to pray recognizing God alone can and will restore justice? Yes. Is it wrong to pray that God would do that very thing? No, I don't think it's wrong. Well, that's an imprecatory prayer. I mean, these prayers are gritty and they are they can be ugly, but they have at their very heart deep and profound truths. Am I going to pray for God to put injustice to an end? Yes. You know, the man who kidnaps young women and forces them to be slaves, am I going to pray for God to bring that man to justice? Well, first I'm going to pray for God to change that man's heart and to break his heart over what he's doing to these young women and then to move him to radical repentance in Jesus Christ. But if God, if, if that man will not do that, then yeah, I'm going to pray for that man to be caught by the police and be brought to justice. Am I going to pray um, for men and women who persecute Christians and force them to flee their homes as refugees? Am I going to pray for those men and women to be brought to justice? Yes. Am I going to pray for ISIS to be torn apart? Yes, I am. Because that organization does horrible, horribly evil things. Now, first of all, what I'm going to pray is that God will bring all of their leaders to repentance in the name of Jesus Christ. Because that's ultimately what's going to be best. Can you imagine? Wouldn't that be awesome? They come to know Jesus, and they're all of a sudden going, yeah, you know, God is the one who's just, uh, this, uh, this jihad stuff, we don't, we're not going there anymore. I mean, crazy, right? Wouldn't that be amazing? But if that's not going to happen, then I'm going to pray for them to be brought to justice, that God will bring an end to that organization because of how much suffering and evil they bring to the world. Right? So, yes, praying imprecatory prayers are okay. Now, at the very heart of praying an imprecatory prayer is that question, Lord, is there something in me? That's what David's talking about in Psalm 130, 139. At the end, he says, Lord, search my heart. See if there's anything wicked or destructive in me and lead me in your way everlasting. He said, Look, I have these strong feelings. I love you. Yes, I can't stand these people. I'm so angry with them, but search me and see if there's anything evil in me, right? And we always have to, when we're doing imprecatory prayers, it's this realization of like, yeah, you know, this person who does this thing that I think is so evil, am I truly more worthy of God's love than them? No. No, I'm a sinner just like them. That's the, that's the scandal of grace, is that God comes into my life and has made me aware of the depths of, of my sin and has offered me salvation through Jesus Christ. That's, that's the beauty, right? That, that, that's the wonder of grace. And he could do that to anyone, right? And so, so that's, that's got to be at the heart of imprecatory prayers. But folks, the reality is, underneath it all, when these prayers are said in the book of Psalms, they are about God's greatness, mercy, they are psalms of deep love 
de- devotion to God and a desire to see God's glory lifted high. And they are psalms that teach us about God's justice. The fact that God is just, that he is a warrior, that he's, he's a mighty warrior, that he is the Lord of hosts. We're going to sing a song about this in a moment. That it's going to be new to some of you, or many of you probably. And so as we sing it, I want to ask you to focus on, just, just read the words along with us as they go along the screen. It's really a profound song built out of Psalm 46. So this is the question I want to ask you today as we get ready to close up. Get ready to pray. How deeply is God's justice and the fact that He is going to restore, how deeply is that belief rooted in your heart? Or maybe maybe you've forgotten. And maybe there's a part of you that has held on to for unforgiveness or bitterness. Part of you that is looking at this world and just full of anger and fear. Someone in this world who you're mad at because they can't do that to me. But for us, many of us, our world is often on fire, right? Right? I have a boss who's mad at me because I read my Bible at the break, at my lunch break, or, you know, a, a high schooler and my friends make fun of me because I want to wait till marriage. World around me, I hate. Father, it's flashback or. Day, you will restore all things. And today may not be that day, but someday you will. Someday you'll make it all right. Someday. And in the meantime, will you strengthen me? You will make all things new. You are the God of justice. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your presence here today. This is a hard topic because, Lord, we we are in a world that is so politically correct, so so, um, focused on saying the right thing, and yet so divided. Our culture is so full of contempt, God. Everywhere you turn, everywhere you look, on Facebook, on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, all these other places, God, on on the news, there's contempt, blame. It's your fault. This happened. You need to make this right, all this stuff. It's all of this. And there's so much pain. Lord, deep in our hearts, we know that you alone are the one who can bring true justice because you are just. And Lord, our hearts cry out, how long, how long must we wait, Lord, until you return? But we realize that you wait because there are more that you want to save. There are more that you want to hear the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. That this world may be dying. That this world may be heading for destruction, but you offer salvation that is eternal. Life with you, God, forever. So Lord, we look to you as the one who says, Behold, I make all things new. You are our great Father, our great King, our great Savior. We love you.
So Lord, be, be with our thoughts as we continue in worship. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. of God, the nations at his feet. He breaks the bow and bends the spear and tells the wars to cease. Oh, mighty one of Israel, you are on our side. We walk by faith in God who burns the chariots of
as we go into this last song, I'd just like to take a minute to pray for this morning's offering. Please join me. God, you are good. I pray that you will make us good stewards of what you have given to us. I pray that these tithes and offerings will be used to further your kingdom. And I thank you for being with us during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. To your freedom, our chains are gone. No weapon form shall prevail. Your word is stronger. We all Saints are clearing by your grave. Your kingdom forever will stand. We won't be shaken. We will not be. Our God, our mighty warrior, you are consuming fire. In victory, you reign. We triumph in your name, Jesus.
are a mighty warrior. In victory, we have triumphed in your name, Father. And so, Lord, remind us of that this week. Father, no matter what happens in this world, we know that you are coming to restore and to make all things new. And we look forward to that day. We pray with great trust in your greatness. We pray with great desire and and love for you. And we pray in great hope that you are just and you are good. And so we thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you for your presence here. May you bring glory to your name in and through our lives. And we pray this thing, we all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Just one last thing before I uh, let you go. If you have prayer requests, please, please feel free to email us. Email amber at snchurch.com. And you can send prayer requests to her and our elders of our church pray as well as our prayer team for you. And you can come, you can even just write in something and say an anonymous prayer request or whatever. We even pray for those, okay? So please feel free to do that. Wayne is the leader of our prayer team. He prayed to open our service today. And so he's been leading this team and, and our, our uh, prayer chain is very, very effective in praying, in praying and very, very diligent to pray. So we're just uh, very grateful for you. Have a great, wonderful weekend and we'll see you soon.